Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you through, through three polling apps that you can try out in your teaching this week. Um, I'm gonna show you a brief introduction and how to get started with them and show you some examples of how I've used them in the past. I hope that this might feel um, useful for you and I hope that we can imagine some ways that we might leverage this as a, a formative feedback or assessment tool in our classroom. Um, and please make sure that you stay in touch. Let me know if any of these work for you or if you're looking for other polling apps that can do other things. So what I have here is I have three chosen that I really like and I find to be versatile and useful tools. However, the thing to know about polling apps is that these are a dime a dozen. There's lots of them out there. And so these represent just the most flexible ones that I think are out there. However, if you come across uh, another one and you think it's so useful for your program or for your area, then just let me know and I'll add it to uh, the list of ones that I feature in things like workshops and on our online resources. So the first polling app that I wanna take you through is called Mentimeter. And to get to it, you're just gonna go to mentimeter.com. Um, this is a free online app. This is not affiliated in any way, shape, or form with your Conestoga login credentials. This is just something that you're going to register for a free account with. So you can see that on my landing page, it says things like welcome back and your presentations or start a new quiz. Um, but for you, for the first time, you're gonna see things like sign up to get started. So if you'd like, pause the video right now and go ahead and sign up for a free account. Once you've done that, you're gonna land inside Mentimeter. And let's take a look at what presentations might look like in Mentimeter. Now, if this was your first time signing up, it's going to pull you into a presentation. So you are already going to have a new presentation up and ready and loaded. Let me go ahead and build one to catch up with you. This might be more along the lines of what you see on your screen, where you can tell that you're on Mentimeter, got a default title up here at the top, which you can click to change that title. And then when you look at the slide, it kind of looks like a PowerPoint slide with the, the list of slides along the side. And it's literally telling you what to do next. So choose a slide type. You can see that I can choose from a variety of types on the right. I have multiple choice, image choice, word cloud, scales, open-ended, 100 points, ranking, matrixes, competitions, Q&As, and forums. And then I also have quizzes. So you can feel free to choose from any of these types of questions. Where I think that Mentimeter can be really high value is by doing audience polling at the beginning of class or a pre-assessment, as you might call it in the box. Uh, lesson planning model. So one type of pre-assessment that I like to do is often a word cloud. What are some key terms from this week? You can see that I can allow my students to enter more than one um, response. And here I might ask them to enter in five different key terms that they can remember off the top of their head. This will allow me to make a really robust picture of the term that they uh, have encountered in their learning. The other thing that I'm going to do as part of my initial setup is I'm going to turn on that profanity filter just because I like to be a, a person of caution. And I'm actually going to select all languages see that it can filter for things like emojis, filter in English, in Hindi, in Portuguese, Spanish, and more. Um, and certainly if there is a language that you think uh, should be filtered but isn't available here, you can reach directly out to support at Mentimeter.com to see them bring this in to, uh, into the tool. Another option or another extra here is allow audience to submit more than one. Now, I've already allowed my students to put in five entries, and I want my Mentimeter to track total number of students who are participating. 
So I'm not going to turn on the extra to allow audience to submit more than. I can move on and I can further customize or I can just present this to my class and I can ask them to input their results. So how might I present this to my class? What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my students to open up their browser on whatever device they have available. So if you have a cell phone, you can open up your browser on your cell phone. If you have um, a tablet, you can do it there. If you have a laptop, whatever is nearby. The other thing that I might say is that uh, I know many of you might have a phone. However, some of you may not. So if you do not have a phone or a device available to you, I'll encourage you to partner up with somebody who does. Again, I'm not looking to measure or track individual responses. I'm just looking to measure students retention and I can do that. Um, in an informal basis using this tool, which doesn't rely on knowing which student answered which question. So what are some key concepts from this week? Because some key terms from this week's concept. Well, I'm going to use Mentimeter as an example and I'm going to say that it's an excellent tool for feedback. It's an excellent tool for um, pre-assessments. It's an excellent tool for review. And as I submit those responses, they're going to appear here on the screen live. There they come. Now, the more often someone selects a term like feedback, the larger it's going to appear on the screen. Is a word cloud. The other thing that I can do is if I hit back on my browser, I can actually add more than one slide or more than one question to this presentation. So my first question might be, what are some key terms? And my next question might be something like scale. Rate your confidence following topic. And I might ask students to rate themselves on a scale of one to five on how confident they feel, um, not confident, very confident, or one is very confident, one is not confident and uh, five is very confident and rate themselves on various statements about, or various um, topics that we should have covered in their homework or pre-reading. So as I add those statements or those topics here, you'll see that when I present this, my students will now be able to rate themselves and their confidence in the, on those varied topics. Let me reload this on my device, and now I'm going to rate myself on a variety of statements related to this week's content. And so what I get is not only an average of the students' responses, but where the exact responses fell. So I could see if a lot of my students reported that they felt very confident in one area, I might not cover that area extensively in today's class. Whereas if they rated themselves very low in another area, that is an area of focus for so Mentimeter offers a variety of question types. It offers you um, some really good analytic data on where your class as a whole falls um, on various topics. The one thing to know about Mentimeter is that uh, you are limited to only two questions per code. So you can see that this particular slide deck has a code of 256950. And so that code will only let them answer two questions. But if I go back into my Mentimeter, you'll take a look at my, my uh, Mentimeter polls and you'll see that I have, an, I have a large amount of polls that I've developed. Uh, there is no limit to how many two question polls you can build. And in fact, if I wanted to run a quiz, let me build a new presentation with a quiz. I can actually build slide decks that have up to five questions. 
So a quiz is only going to be a multiple choice question. And I can have as many multiple choice quizzes, questions as I would like. I can also build combinations of quiz questions and standard question types in order to have a stack of up to five questions. So you can see this is a quiz of five questions where those students are answering multiple choice questions. However, I can still add in a word cloud. If I would like to have five quiz questions and a word cloud, I can do that. The other things that I can do is easily reorder those questions. And as soon as I go to hit present, just be able to present that, uh, that stack of five questions. As you start to build out how many questions you have, you might start to need to use folders in order to organize your information. You can see I have one folder here that I run in my PDEVO 551 workshop. And within that, I have all the question stacks that I might run for that particular workshop. You can start to organize a little bit more effectively there. But for a long time, I stayed here in the dashboard because there's a lot of quick action buttons out here. I can easily just show the presentation for one of the quiz questions by clicking the play button. You can see I've got menti.com and use the code 683037 and my students can just start answering the quiz. If I hit back and I go back to my main dashboard, I can see that it was last created about two minutes ago, last updated about a minute ago, and I've got a few more options that I can toggle. See there's a remote feature, there's voting links if I want to course, post this in my course shell. I can download the results. Unfortunately, in the free version, you only see a limited quantity of results. However, you can see general trends, and I'll show you that in just a minute. I can move my presentation to a folder. I can duplicate the questions if I like the structure of them and just want to change the wording, or I can delete a quiz. So let's take a look at a survey that has some, um, some data behind it. And I'll show you what data trends tracking in Mentimeter looks like. So video sources, I typically run in another workshop that I do, video lessons to get students engaged in talking. And you can see that this presentation has some results on the slides. So I can see that uh, in my last, in the last time that I ran this workshop, I had two participants and I can see both where their specific answers fell and where they averaged out to be. And if I take a look on the, on the right hand side, I now have two choices. I can reset results, you cannot down re download results, that's part of the paid feature, or I can show trends. And if I look at these trends, I can see the last two instances that I ran this workshop and where those results fall. So this time is the active time and the, the results fell here. Um, and then the first time that I ran, other people, that class demonstrated more competency in this particular area, so their trend fell a little higher. So I can start to track over time where my students typically are positioned um, on some core concepts or core areas of the course. And this gives me a lot of good information about how to prepare for my planning for my course delivery. Um, and maybe topics where I can spend less time and topics where I should definitely focus. So there is a limited amount of trends data here. Students uh, anonymously participate in Mentimeter. And there's a lot of value uh, that I've had reported to me from Conestoga faculty about participating anonymously in this kind of thing. Uh, a lot of the times we wanna be able to track which student answered which question correctly but a lot of faculty find that students are more likely to participate and participate honestly if they know that the results are anonymous. Um, so that's one thing to consider. Well, based on the type of question, maybe Mentimeter is a great tool for you because it might allow students a little bit more privacy um, and a little bit more access. So play around with Mentimeter, start by building some new presentations, try it out, test it out on your phone at home. You can always clear the results. 
and let me know if you like Mentimeter as a tool. Remember, you can always reach out to me by email, jwilkinson at conestogac.on.ca, or you can just keep playing with Mentor. The next tool I'm going to show you is Kahoot. And Kahoot is certainly well-loved here at Conestoga, and it's well-loved by our students. They have already played it in, uh, in high school or in elementary school by the time they get here. So Kahoot's been around for a long time. Uh, it feels very fun and very engaging. You can see by the video that I'm running that students are really intrigued by it. It does feel like a competition or a game. So I would reserve it only for those opportunities that I'm looking to have a game-like feel to the class experience. Um, it's not well suited to question and answer periods where I'm looking for a more serious vibe. In that case, I would be more inclined to use Mentimeter. But if maybe you're looking to jazz up your review sessions or you're looking to, um, to get students engaged in, in learning and, and do partner or pair-based activities that have them kind of working together as a team, then maybe Kahoot is for you. So for me, I'm going to log in. But for you, take a moment and sign up for free. I'll let you pause the video and go ahead and do that now. So when I log in for the first time, I might see something that kind of prompts me towards purchasing a license. However, I, there will be an option if I scroll down on the page uh, to just continue with the free feature. When you first land in Kahoot, you're going to land maybe somewhere like this. Like I said, Kahoot is well loved and it's been around for a while. So there are a lot of Kahoots already out there that people are sharing and leveraging in their teaching. A lot of people just kind of shop around for Kahoots and pull one out and use that one. You see that there's a search button to search across Kahoot, where it'll pull up any, commute, any Kahoot that's tagged with that. And you can take a look at these Kahoots and determine whether or not these 22 questions in particular might already suit the course delivery that you're doing. However, at the post-secondary level, I don't know that there's a lot of Kahoot that are out there that already reflect what we would teach. And I don't know that there's a lot of Kahoot out there that would get into your specific content. So we're probably more often going to go towards creating our own Kahoots and sharing them with our teaching team. So I'll drive you over to this Create button. And you'll see that when we create a Kahoot, it takes us right into the choice of what type of Kahoot to create. There are three types, a quiz, a jumble, or a survey. Now remember, if we're asking serious questions, I don't know if we want to gamify surveys all that often. Um, I would probably be more likely to choose multiple choice questions in Mentimeter than to, to use this survey function. However, for a jumble where students reorganize uh, or reorder different topics or content areas, or for a quiz where they're trying to answer multiple choice questions, uh, that's where Kahoot is really uh, a strong tool to consider. So let's try building a quiz. And I'm just going to title mine quiz because a title is required. You can see that there's even a title, a character limit on how long my title can be. We should think a little bit brief in terms of how much text we're writing here. And the description, which again is required, requires some uh, tags in it, hashtags, in order to be able to make it searchable in the Kahoot inventory. So I'm going to add a hashtag of my PDEV, my course code because then I would be able to come in here and just search for my, my workshop code, and I would be able to come back into my resources that I had prepared. In the same way, you would be able to come into Kahoot and search by your Conestoga course code, and you would be able to pull up any Kahoots that have been created with that course hashtag. You can control who this Kahoot is visible to. The default is everyone. The alternative is only me. The language is English, however, there's a variety in there if you are teaching uh, one of our languages programs. And you can choose, and in fact, you must choose an audience. In my context, that audience is training. You may choose one of the other ones. If you need to give credit resources, 
can insert citations here. And you'll see that I also have the ability to bring in introductory videos. So if I have a YouTube link, say from the Teaching and Learning YouTube, I can actually grab that link, Teaching and Learning Conestoga. A lot of teaching and learning out there. I can pull open one of these videos and just grab the link and bring it over. And going to choose to up using video. Go. And I'm going to up that. Paste it right over into. Now the, when I first run my Kahoot, my students are going to be prompted to watch a video, and then they're going to be prompted to answer questions about that video. And the only option that I have by the time I get to the bottom of that screen is to hit OK Go. You'll also notice that you have the ability to add some images here. You can upload images that you have or that you've downloaded from uh, maybe one of the open image repositories at the library from the labeled for reuse Google images, or you can get images from the Getty library. Now, the Getty images is behind a paywall. You will not be able to access that without paying for an account. Okay, go. And it takes me instantly into the add a question. You'll see that I can add individual questions. Question one. I do have a character limit here as well, the uh, limited ability to bold and italicize text, add superscript and subscript, and to a limited extent, use mathematical um, annotation, currency annotation, uh, or Greek characters. For the time limit, uh, we want to open up the time limit for students to participate in this kind of activity. Uh, we know that time test is actually a major trigger of things like anxiety. And uh, the intention with this type of quiz is just to review content, uh, not to create a condition of anxiety for students. So I would strongly advocate for just opening up that time limit. Uh, and you can choose to keep the point system. However, I find uh, it slows the game down because it stops and it checks points and who's on the top of the podium. So I actually usually turn it off so that I can uh, I can manage who's winning and who's who's how well my students are doing, and then I can put in my answers. My answer one, two, three, four, and then I can designate which answers might be correct. I can have multiple correct answers. I can have um, multiple incorrect answers just by choosing or not choosing. Uh, those fields. And again, if I need to credit, say, the textbook, maybe this question comes straight out of the textbook, I can insert a citation here at the bottom. I can pull in images from the textbook or from another online resources, or again, I can add a YouTube link. So this question building is pretty flexible. When I hit next, you can see I'm taken back to the main quiz dashboard where I can continue to add questions. If you have, say, a spreadsheet full of questions already, you can import those easily. There's even a template from Kahoot that you can grab where it will um, let you pull questions into that template spreadsheet, and then that's what you pull up here into Kahoot. So don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel if you have a wonderful question bank and you'd like to use it with this new tool. Uh, there's definitely a way for you to try that out. Once I have questions built, you can see I can easily edit them. I can duplicate them. If I've created a good structure that I want to just then edit and adjust uh, a few core items of information in. And I can also delete particular questions as they may or may not continue to be relevant. I can reorder uh, my questions pretty easily just by dragging and dropping. And once I'm done, I just hit that Save button, and I'm taken into my Saved and Published page. In here, I can choose to go back and edit it, preview it the way it would appear for my students, play it live in class, or share it. So what you might choose to do at this point in time is preview it. Let's take a look at what a Kahoot looks like from the student experience. 
So you'll remember at the beginning that you and I went into Kahoot.com to play this game. However, once you set up your dashboard to do a classic play, you'll notice that um, students are instead directed to join at Kahoot.it or download the app. For most of your students, it will be easier to just go to Kahoot.it on their device. Open up your browser, go to Kahoot.it, um, and use this six-digit game code pin to join the game. One, seven, zero, five, six, six. And when they enter the game, they're going to be prompted to put in their nickname. So let's test that out over here. One, seven, zero, five, six, six. Enter. Okay, their nickname is going to be Jess. And go. Checking your nickname, making sure it's appropriate. Jess is part of the starting. Naughty nicknames beware. One click on your name and you're out of the game. If you click on a student's name, then they will not be allowed to participate in this particular game. There we go. Once I've got all my students in, I can click start. You can see what it looks like on the student devices, and this is what will be presented at your screen at the front of the class. So question one is your answer one, two, three, or four, and students will choose from those exact same um, shapes and colors that correspond on their personal device. So I've got I made my choice. It was incorrect. I know my choice was incorrect. And there are some auditory inputs that tell me that as well. And I'm able to see generally how the class did. Again, this is anonymous participation. As the teacher at the front of the room, I'm going to choose to go to the next question. Here's my scoreboard. Yes, you're doing fantastic. Next, question two. What is the answer to question two? Is it one, two, three, or four? This time I'm going to, as a student, choose number two. And I see how I compare to the class. I know if I'm correct or not. Let's hit next. My last question, question three, unfortunately named here, question one. Could be one, two, three, or four. And I'm going to choose one in this case as the student. Fantastic. So as the faculty member, I get to see, you know, who performed well in my class. And as the faculty member, I can get results, meaning that I can download and save my results as an Excel file. So if you do need a report of how students did on this uh, particular review, you'd like to be able to measure and track their performance, according to the nickname that they put into their Kahoot, then you can download that report and it shows you who answered which questions correctly. So there, if you don't grab it at this moment in time though, you're not able to collect that information. So Kahoot, pretty well loved. Um, those who like it, like it a lot. Uh, students like it because it feels interesting, it feels like a game, there's some music to it, there's some interesting components to it. However, you know, uh, it's not for every application. Once you've built a Kahoot or two, here in your Kahoots area, you'll see a list of all of the Kahoots that you might have built and a little preview of what they look like. And at any point in time, you can play those. There's even the ability to do things like challenges, which I'll let you explain. So you have a dashboard. At any point in time, you can uh, run any of the Kahoots that you've built. Sometimes it's nice to build Kahoots that are flexible across a variety of classes. Oh, here's the reports dashboard. Let's take a look at what we can see there. Oh, look, you can download the results. That's fantastic. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, is Kahoot. Uh, students like it. It feels very game-like. It feels very fun and interesting. Fantastic way to review content or concepts. Get students talking. 
Um, if all of your students don't have a device in the class, I would encourage them to partner up and work with somebody who does have a device. So the reports are a nice way for you to get some data to inform your planning and some data to also make good predictions about what student performance at the midterm and on the final exam might look like so that you can provide early intervention. So with that in mind, I'm gonna leave Kahoot here and encourage you to both try this out, um, test out Kahoot, see what you do and don't like about it, you know, what applications you might put this to in your own teaching and stay in touch with me, right? Reach out to Jay, Jay Wilkinson at conestogac.on.ca. Let me know if you like Kahoot and how you're using it in the class. Keep in mind too that Kahoot has their own, um, has their own help and support area. So if you click on this question mark, you'll see that they have a full library uh, of information about how to use Kahoot. They have a blog where they tell you about new features and you can actually get certified as a Kahoot teacher. So if that's something you'd like to add to your CV or your LinkedIn profile, the certification can uh, just sometimes be a few quizzes or questions, um, some examples of how you use this in your own teaching, and that's one thing to consider. You can also suggest features. They're looking for feedback on this tool and how they can make it work better for you. So definitely um, be engaged in the commu Kahoot community and stay in touch with me about how you like using this. In the last tool that I'm gonna show you is built right into your email account. So sometimes we're looking for something that um, is not necessarily a live survey in the class, or maybe doesn't feel gamified. What we're sometimes what we're looking for is a way to get students to offer feedback or input into something. So something that we might look for is a form or a survey that students can answer at their own pace and somewhat more reflectively than they would answer a Mentimeter or a Kahoot. And built into your Office 365 email, you have a whole host of apps, one of which is Form. And if we take a look in forms, you'll actually see that I have a lot of love for forms. Um, I have so many forms in my, uh, my forms dashboard right now. However, yours may be completely blank, but I use forms for a variety of purposes in my work. Uh, I have some self-reflection forms. I do some tracking for my work. I do my workshop feedback. And that's certainly one application that you could consider using uh, forms for is how do you receive feedback from your students on how um, the learning experience is going on in your class at this point in time. So with Success Week coming up or the midpoint of the, the semester kind of coming up, is there an opportunity for you to create a little feedback form that might let students offer you some insight into how they're learning uh, what they like about your teaching and what they might like to see. Another option to think about is uh, in group projects, how do we solicit feedback from our students? So for example, I have one here where I've created a group project feedback. Form. And in this group project feedback form, I've created, you know, here's a little image of a group use this opportunity to reflect on your performance in the group task. Please rate your own performance on the following criteria. And I have a little, uh, a little lit, um, Likert scale here. Did my students engage early in on this project? Were they diligent in attending all planned meetings? Were they completing tasks assigned to you? And you can continue to add statements. I can continue to add statements as I choose to adapt or revise this, this survey semester over semester. So to edit my survey, it really just looks like clicking into group prod, clicking into anywhere and starting to change the text. I can add questions at any point in time, but as I scroll down, my strengths in this project were, maybe I want to add a, um, a rating questions where I say, overall, how would you rate the collaborative um, collaboration 
of your group. So I'm not asking the student to evaluate any one particular in, in any one person in particular. I'm, a, I'm asking them to give an input as to how their group collaborated overall. You see that this is a star rating system. I can choose that, change that from a five star rating system to a 10 star rating system. And I can even change it from a star to a number if I would like. But here I'm liking the star. I can enforce certain questions to be responded to by turning them on as required. I can copy questions, delete questions, move them up or down in, uh, in my ordering. Um, and I can continue to add questions throughout my entire form. Now, once I have a form built, I can easily preview my form from my student's perspective. If I preview this survey, what's it going to look like to my students on their computer? Here's exactly what it looks like to them. And in fact, here's what it looks like for them to even answer some of it. Oh, okay, I've got my lit my Likert scale. I've rated my performance. I've entered some text. And I click submit. How does it look differently on the computer than on mobile? Let's check that out. Oh, let's submit another response. Fantastic. One, two, three, five, and six. And I've submitted my response. Fantastic. It seems user friendly. It seems, uh, you know, it looks appealing on desktop or mobile. Let's go back and fix that, uh, incor that um, incorrect area that I found in my preview. And I know that was in here in my Likert scale. I had one, two, this should be three, four, five. There we go, I've updated my changes, and now in my preview, those changes are live. One, two, three, five. At any point in time, even if a survey is live, if you find an error in it, you can change that error and it will appear for all new participants. And take a look what's happening over here in my responses slide deck, or in my responses area. When I click that, there's those two responses that I just input into my preview. So I've got two responses. It took me about 20 seconds to do each one. My survey is active. I can view the individual results or pull open an Excel file with all of my results. However, you do not need to crunch data when you do a survey in forms because it gives you a response dashboard that already shows you things like the overall rating for a group or the overall ratings across your class of students' performance in particular areas. Um, this is color-coded, it's very straightforward to see. Even if uh, you were colorblind, you would be able to see this because the color coding is appropriate. Um, and you can look at individual responses for each uh, text entry by clicking on more details and you can see how individual students responded to um, this question asking about their strengths. I can also go individually through each particular student's response. So if I click view results, my first responder was myself, Jesslyn, and it took Jesslyn 24 seconds to complete. Overall, Jesslyn rated their group performance at eight stars, and here's how Jesslyn ranked herself, um, and here are the strengths that Jesslyn identified. If I scroll to the next review, I can see that this is the second submission for Jesslyn, or it would be the next submission from the next student. Overall ranking, um, overall uh, Likert scale on their performance and their particular strengths. If I saw one that I found concerning or that I wanted to follow up with uh, with a face-to-face -face meeting, I could print that response. It doesn't have to be a paper print. It just gives you a document that you can save somewhere. And I can, I can refer to that, those responses in that meeting. So if I pull open print response, you'll see that it opens up the print window. I can change my printer. To save as PDF. And there I will have a saved PDF of this student's responses to a self feed survey. 
So this really lets me um, refer to this actively sort of in the moment. I don't know that we would always necessarily need to print responses, but it, it is available if you'd like it. So this is the results view pane. Let me go back to my original survey and take a look back again at my question. How do I get this survey out to my students? Well, I share it with them. You see that when I open the share window, uh, I have the share link to send and collect responses. And I can set some privacy for my, my survey. Um, right now, the privacy is by default set to only people within Conestoga College can respond. This means students will need to sign in with their Conestoga email address in order to respond to the survey. However, I can open that up and I can say, you know what, anybody that I send this to, anybody who has the link can answer this survey. I'm going to post the link in my Conestoga course shell. Some of my students, you know, may not actively participate in using their email account from Conestoga. So I can open it up to anyone with the link can respond if I need to. And then it gives me a link. And I can easily copy and paste this link into my eConestoga course shell. Now, this is fantastic. What it lets us do is build um, quizzes or surveys or templates of things that, uh, that we can use to support our learners and to do some reflective feedback. If you'd like to get fancy by using a QR code or embedding this into your course shell, you can do that. Or you can straight up email it right out to your uh, class participants, whatever you like. However, what I haven't done is made this survey available to any of my colleagues just yet. So we know that uh, one of the primary ways that we share content around at Conestoga is by putting it in our course shells. And so, um, at the same time that I might put this link for my students in the course shell so that they can click through and do my survey, I might also click share as a template to be able to put a link into my course shell which some of my colleagues could, uh, could use to be able to see my original survey and make their own or adapt their own copy of it. So this link, I would probably post in my course shell in draft mode so that anyone else who, who borrows from my course shell might also be able to see the, the survey that I gave to them. And again, it's a simple copy and paste over into eConestoga so that uh, people can share their content. So that is forms in a nutshell. You'll see that I can easily create a new form or a new quiz right here on the main dashboard. And as I start to build and populate out my forms and quizzes, they'll appear here just below. If I've created a form that I like, but I wanna slightly adapt it, rather than recreating that form, I can easily copy that form. You'll see I also have forms that are shared with me. As your colleagues start sharing forms with you or you start building these resources and sharing them around, you'll be able to find content in the shared with me. So forms, again, a fantastic tool. It's wonderfully free and you'll find it here on the, the landing page for your email. Um, you can easily you know, jump into forms and use it across a variety of purposes. I don't know that it's as live or engaging an experience as Kahoot, but certainly when we want um, students to participate with, infer with feedback or information in a more serious and reflective tone, forms can be an excellent way to solicit that feedback. Um, I use it extensively. I really like it. However, um, I hope that this kind of gave you a big picture overview of it. I hope that you'll take some time to explore form uh, and that you might find that it has some value for you in your own context. Again, stay in touch. My email is jwilkinson at conestogac.on.ca. Tell me if you like forms or not. There's a lot of faculty at Conestoga who are trying uh, things other than Mentimeter, things other than Kahoot, and things other than form, and who really like those. Some example of those alternatives are Socrative, Poll Everywhere, and Plickers. And a lot of people find that those tools might be more valuable for them in their own context 
If that's the case, I'm prepared to support you with those. Remember, all of these tools have inbuilt um, support and help resources. So Microsoft Forms, you'll see that even on this landing area, there's going to be a little support area here in the ellipses, help. That takes you directly to Microsoft's help and support resources for forms. Kahoot had a help and support resources area. Mentimeter has a help and support resources area. All of these tools have online support. You don't have to feel like you have to come into Conestoga to get to that help or training and use it. So this is a very broad, big picture overview of what we would typically cover in the polling apps for the classroom workshop. I hope that it gave you three tools to, to start exploring in your own teaching, and I hope that you maybe already have some ideas generated about how you might leverage this. So a bit of a takeaway. On our teaching and learning website, you'll notice that if you, you can get here by Googling teaching and learning Conestoga, it'll be the first result that comes up. But on our teaching and learning website, you'll notice that we have technology for teaching page. And on here is a list of all of uh, the technology that you might currently leverage in your classroom, including polling apps. And in here, you'll see that I've got my, my course free listed, but I've also got clickers and, uh, and poll everywhere. Um, and these links will take you right into those apps. Or um, you can continue to explore the use of other technology here at Conestoga. Maybe you're curious about using your OneDrive. Or maybe you're curious about using our interactive projector. We've got tips, how to down the soft, download the software, and tutorial guides and videos um, that you can access, all from our teaching and learning website. So stay in touch, reach out, look online for resources for support, and let me know how I can help you uh, bring polling apps into your classroom.